State 5. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. We now move to topical questions. To question number one, Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the announcement of a referendum on membership of the European Union on the 23rd of June 2016. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. The Scottish Government requested that the referendum should not be held on the June 23rd and are concerned that the referendum campaign will cut across election campaigns for the Scottish Parliament and other devolved administrations. The decision on the date has now been made, however, and we have to move on. The conclusion of an agreement at the European Council last week means the focus can now shift to the bigger and much more important matter of why our continued European Union membership is overwhelmingly in Scotland and the UK's best interests. The Scottish Government will continue to make the positive case for EU membership. In making our case, we will continue to emphasise that the EU is not just an economic union, important as that is, but a means of solidarity, social protection and mutual support between members. For more than 40 years, individuals, businesses and communities across Scotland have experienced the many social, economic and cultural benefits of EU membership. These include jobs, significant investment, the opportunity of our businesses to trade across the world's largest single market, social protections like employment rights and the opportunity to work in solidarity with others across the continent to tackle pressing global challenges such as the movement of refugees and migrants, energy security and climate change. Christina McKelvey. Um, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Uh, um, and in addition to, to all of those benefits that she mentions, um, surely we, we should all agree that the European Union is not just about economic union, it's also about the social union that has delivered so many valuable social and employment protections for people across its entire territory. And it is best placed to tackle these issues that don't respect national boundaries, such as climate change and the recent refugee crisis. Cabinet Secretary. Indeed, one of the strongest arguments for the European Union is the social Europe. And indeed, many of the aspects of the social Europe uh, contract has been, uh, and the social Europe chapter, have been hard fought by those looking for protections for maternity rights, for equal pay issues, and for wider agenda items in relation to um, the right to, to work and have paid uh, holidays in terms of the working hour week, 48 hours working hour week. These are all things that are very practical, very real. And quite frankly, I think leaving those, those issues in the hands of a Conservative government out with the protection of Europe and that uh, wider social Europe protection is a risk indeed. But let's argue that positive case, one that takes us uh, to develop the Europe that we want to seek. And I think in seeking uh, issues, whether it's social Europe or whether it's on issues of energy security, or as I mentioned, climate change, a lot has been achieved, but a lot more could be achieved. And uh, Europe, remember, was born out of a need for nations to cooperate rather than live in conflict. And that is the Europe that we seek. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the campaign to remain in the European Union should learn lessons from Scotland's independence referendum and be a positive campaign? And that's why it's better for Scotland and the rest of the UK to remain within the EU rather than lapse into scaremongering and fear. And does she agree with me that everyone who has the right to vote in this nation should have the right to vote in that referendum? I, I agree, and democracy is a very precious thing, and there'll be people that will be voting in our elections in May this year that will be denied votes in the European referendum, and I don't think that is acceptable. We also have a situation where, in facing the European referendum, people want to see a positive vision. They want to hear the arguments. We can make the arguments. And indeed, I think in Scotland, we have a mature electorate that is very well politically informed, and they will not ex uh, accept scaremongering from either side of uh, the referendum campaign. And I think in Scotland, we can actually conduct a positive argument that is detailed, that does address the issues, but also inspires people about the type of country we want to be, but also the type of of country that can contribute to a positive social Europe. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. I do welcome the Cabinet Secretary's positive comments, but it has been in contrast with the Scottish Government's initial reaction to the announcement of the date. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that with such a short time frame towards the referendum, we must make the strong positive case instead of concentrating on personalities, potential leadership bids, and using one referendum to discuss another? It is now the time to get serious about the debate ahead. Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, as with the, the leaders of Wales, Northern Ireland, uh, our First Minister indicated the concern we had about that date. But as I said in our answer, we must move on. The date is now set. Uh, we, we can contribute to the debate in a wider, uh, a wider canvas. And people want to hear the views of Scotland. Uh, I regularly meet with uh, governments from across Europe interested in our arguments about where it can be and should be. And when making our arguments for Europe, we, we won't just be making them in Scotland or wider field. People will want to hear what we're saying uh, in other countries across Europe. I I think that is the positive for force of a democratic debate that is hard, uh, ha hard in its argument, but also takes a, a view as to what we can contribute, not just what we can get. And this should not be about personalities. It should not be about other issues. We should focus on the issues. And by focusing on the issues and the big picture, we respect not just the people of Scotland, but the rest of the UK as well. Jimmy McGregor. Uh, thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the European and External Relations Committee is undertaking a far-reaching inquiry into implications of EU reform and the EU referendum with evidence from many eminent witnesses. Would she agree with the sentiment of many of the witnesses that leaving the European Union will be bad for Scottish exports to the continent, which are currently estimated at 11.6 billion? And does she agree that also that one of the key components of the deal achieved by the Prime Minister is to increase competitiveness and reduce excessive EU relations and, uh, regulations and red tape which will hopefully have a very real positive impact on SMEs in Scotland. Uh, I would congratulate the committee on its very extensive um, inquiry. I think, it's, I think it's provided a great platform to hear different arguments and indeed different perspectives. Uh, Damien McGregor talks about one aspect, which is to do with exports. Yes, there are a large number of companies who want to invest in uh, Scotland and indeed the rest of the UK because of access to uh, the European market. But it's not just about trade or it's not just about exports, despite the fact 300,000 uh, jobs are directly or indirectly uh, involved in the European uh, uh, exercise. I think in terms of where, what he's saying in relation to SMEs, I think that's very important indeed. One of the ways to improve our economic achievements is to increase, in, 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 encourage more of our SMEs to export. By exporting, they become more innovative. So I think there, that's another aspect and an argument. But I do think, I hope the Parliament will have the opportunity to perhaps debate or consider the outcome from that inquiry's um, deliberations because the witnesses have, have been very eminent indeed. They have been wide, widespread. I think it's another example of how this parliament is conducting its inquiries into the European Union in a very positive and constructive way. Question number two, Richard Simpson. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on reports that GP funding has been reduced by £1.6 billion over the last 10 years. Cabinet Secretary Sean Robertson. Investment in GP services has increased each year under this government, rising by almost £150 million from £704.6 million in 2007-08 to £852.6 million in 2014-15. This equates to a cumulative increase of £826 million since this government came to power. We are committed to supporting and developing primary care and the work of GPs. It is an indispensable part of our community health service. However, it is important that the investment made to general practice is seen in a broader context. We are investing in the whole of primary care, and this includes increased investment being made in the ambulance service in 2016-17 and increasing the number of health visitors, which will both have a beneficial impact on general practice as well as increasing our support for community-based mental health services. Scotland has the highest number of GPs per head of population of the four UK countries, and under this government, the number of GPs working in Scotland has increased by 7%. We're transforming primary care, including developing new ways of working with multidisciplinary teams that elevate the role of GPs as medical experts in the community. And that's supported by extra investment of £85 million over three years through the Primary Care Fund. Richard Simpson. <coughs> Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for that answer. Anyone listening to it would think we don't have a problem with general practice at all. And the Royal College's assertion that the share of, share of funding, as opposed to the absolute funding, has reduced by 1.6 billion, uh, is, is totally without any, any consequences. Uh, can I just say to her that the, the constant reiteration of the increase in the numbers of GPs is actually distinctly unhelpful and unwelcome by, by, by the College of General Practitioners and other GPs. The number of full-time equivalents, which is what is critical to the workforce, has only increased by 35 since 2009. Uh, when the population has increased 
uh, by such that the requirement to even stand still for 2009 would have been 110 10, 10 more. I know this to be a new contract, but will she publish the principles that the government will use to underpin that contract so we can have an open discussion about those principles? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, first of all, I, I would have thought more GPs is a, a good thing that would be welcomed by uh, all parts of this chamber. Uh, our calculations based on the published GP spending outturn figures, so this is the actual spend, show GP spend as a percentage of the total health budget has remained relatively stable in both cash and real terms over the last decade. But, um, you know, Richard Simpson uh, said, um, you know, that I, I sounded like there were no challenges. Of course, there are challenges, which is why, of course, we're in the midst of negotiations with the BMA about a new contract, a new contract that will deliver a new model of care for primary care in Scotland, working along uh, lines of a multidisciplinary team with the GPs be being the clinical expert. Those discussions are going very well, indeed very positive discussions. And on the subject of positive discussions, I met with the RCGP on the 9th of February and again we had a positive meeting about uh, that new model of care and how we work together in involving the RCGP and taking that forward. In terms of the principles of the new contract, Richard Simpson will appreciate that we are in the midst of negotiations uh, around that contract. However, I am happy to keep Parliament informed about progress of those negotiations but he'll appreciate that uh, the negotiations are uh, ongoing and uh, I think it would be premature at the moment uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to give any further information because there isn't uh, enough to provide Parliament with a, an update but once there is I would be certainly happy to do that. Richard um, uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I'm not actually asking for you to publish the details of the contract because I entirely understand when you're in negotiations you can't do that. But the principles of the contract, what the general role of the general practitioners will be within the new model, is critical to general practitioners' understanding of where they go and critical to recruitment. So can I just ask her then if the, uh, her... her saying that should be more, I should be welcoming more GPs. Of course I am. But the fact is that there are actually fewer GPs per head of population now than there was in 2009. And for the first time ever, we have gone below the northeast of England, which is the region with which we're normally compared by the Nuffield Trust in terms of regional comparisons. The number of GPs per head in Scotland is now lower than the northeast of England. So would she agree with Professor Graham Watt, who today has stated that 40% of practices representing two million patients are now in difficulty, or is he also misleading or misspeaking? And how does she reconcile the new clinical strategy's emphasis on primary care, which is very welcome, with the fact that the 2016-17 budget yet again cuts the share of funding going to primary care? Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Uh, well, Secretary. I didn't accuse anybody of misleading anyone about anything. What I said was, first of all, Scotland has the highest number of GPs per head of population of the four UK countries. That is a fact. Under this government, the number of GPs working in Scotland has increased by 7%. That is a fact. But, of course, there is more to be done. And as Richard Simpson quite rightly pointed out, the National Clinical Strategy puts primary care at its heart. In terms of the principle of the, the new contract, the new model of care, then there's no secret there. It's very clear that it's based around a multidisciplinary team with the GP being the clinical expert. We are doing a widespread testing of that through the whole of Inverclyde, which will tell us the detail around how that will work in practice and will inform the contract negotiations. But as I said earlier, I'm more than happy to keep Richard Simpson and the rest of Parliament updated on both the testing of the model in Inverclyde and the, the negotiations about the new contract as we take them forward. Lynette Milne. Thank you. Uh, it seems that senior GPs are, are currently queuing up to express their concerns about the percentage fall in GP funding as a share of NHS resources, the latest being Dr Ken Lawton, a senior partner at Aberdeen's Great Western Road Men Medical Practice, who said that at the weekend the shortfall would mean there will be a deterioration of general practice and the service we can offer to patients. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with this comment and what, if any, contribution does she think this funding issue is making to the difficulties in GP recruitment at the present time? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, 
adding to what I've already said to, to Richard Simpson, if you look at the, the draft budget for 2016-17, we're investing an additional £45 million through the Primary Care Fund. That means that the draft budget headline GP and Primary Care Fund is increasing by 9.9% over the year, which is a higher percentage than overall health spending and a higher percentage than territorial boards are receiving. So we are investing in primary care. Uh, in terms of going forward and uh, tackling some of the issues of GP recruitment and retention, that's exactly what the Primary Care Fund is for, is to help to overcome some of those issues. It is very important that we have a, a positive vision for primary care in Scotland, which is why the new model is very important, because we want Scotland to become an attractive place for GPs to come and uh, locate and work here. And we also want uh, young medical students to choose general practice as their specialty. That's why we're working very hard with both the RCGP and the BME uh, to develop this new model of care, which I think will put Scotland at the forefront of, uh, of leading the way with, this, uh, with the vision for primary care. I'll call John Hume, but it needs to be briefed, Mr Hume. Uh, th thank you very, very much, uh, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary said in her answer that GPs are indispensable, but in January the RCGPs stated that they believe the Government deemed GPs to be dispensable. Their own words, it's the uh, RCGP that are stating that the budget has been reduced over the last 10 years by £1.6 billion. Therefore, does the Minister uh, not believe that GPs need more than warm words if we are to avoid a 700 shortfall in GPs in four years' time, as forecast by the RCGPs? Cabinet Secretary. Well, look, we will get on with the job of reforming primary care here in Scotland, and we will work with the RCGP, with the BME, uh, around the new contract to deliver that vision. And far from eroding the role of GPs within that new model, this new model will ensure that the role of the GP uh, is the clinical expert, allowing them more time to spend with their patients. Surely that is something all of us can agree on. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Nicholas.